On behalf of the ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Mark Brantley, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I take great pleasure in welcoming you to this evening's event. This is an important part of the activities of our diplomatic week, and we are pleased that you are present with us. I guarantee that you will not regret your decision to be here, because tonight we will hear from an eminent daughter of the soil, who through her scholarship and aptitude has much to impart to all of us. This morning we heard of the benefits of diplomacy, both multilateral and bilateral, and the importance of effective dialogue. We also benefited tremendously from the excellent presentations offered by panelists from various areas of expertise. Tonight, we are privileged to hear from Professor Jessica Byron, who is the director of the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Previously, <laughs> previously, she lectured at the Mona campus, ultimately becoming the head of the Department of Government, University of the West Indies, Mona, and then visiting professorial fellow for one year at Salesis, Mona. She studied at Cave Hill and St. Augustine campuses of the University of the West Indies before doing her PhD at the Graduate Institute of International Studies University of Geneva in Switzerland. Before teaching at the University of the West Indies, she worked as a Foreign Service Officer with the government of St. Kitts and Nevis and with the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, and then lectured at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, the Netherlands. Professor Byron has published extensively on Caribbean Latin America international relations and on small states and territories in the global political economy. The latest publication, which she co-authored in 2018, is, and I quote, EU and the Caribbean, towards the reconfiguration of the inter-regional landscape, end quote. There are other several publications to her credit, and I commend them all to you, as I'm sure they would make for educational and enlightening material. It is therefore a distinct honor for me to welcome Dr. Jessica Byron, who will in her lecture reinforce our theme, securing a resilient future through strategic diplomacy and effective dialogue. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Byron with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Public officials, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed after this as we cannot really waste more time. Um, good evening, and it is a great pleasure to be with you. And for that, I must thank the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in particular, Permanent Secretary Bass, for the invitation. Now, I'd like to start by saying that the promotion of development and um, human and societal well-being is the raison d'etre of the modern state. And this function is particularly meaningful for developing countries, especially for small island developing states that have attained independence in the post-World War II period. Now, this is crucial to bear in mind when reflecting on St. Kitts Nevis's foreign policy, diplomacy, diplomatic structures, and capabilities in Diplomatic Week 2019. So tonight, I hope I can add a very small dimension to our collective reflections. And I repeat my gratitude to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the government of St. Kitts Nevis for inviting me and by extension, the Institute of International Relations, which I direct at present, to participate in this event. It is an honor to be here, and your hospitality is greatly appreciated. Um, now, I wanted to start, I think uh, this is probably a bit superfluous, but um, 
Let's do it all the same. Just a little map of St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Kitts and Nevis in the regional environment. And then I just wanted to reflect a little bit on size in the international community. Now, 10 countries make up 58% of the population, global populations. And I, and I must say that China and India make up more than a third of the global population. Asia overall is the most populous part of the world. Central America and the Caribbean, on the other hand, make up 1%. And the countries, well, many countries in the Caribbean are at most 0.001% of the size of those giants. Now, if you were to look at it in terms of bubble graphics, um, we would be represented somewhere in those little dots, either to the side of Iran, or some little dots below the Philippines. Those would represent the bubble sizes of a country such as St. Kitts and Nevis, or the other countries in the Eastern Caribbean. We need to bear this in mind when we are thinking of how to use diplomacy um, to make an impact and to be visible on the world stage. Okay, tonight what I want to do is give some reflections on sustainable human development and its specific relevance for SIDS, small island developing states, and for the Caribbean SIDS. Resilience and vulnerability and the discourse around those concepts and their relevance for the Caribbean and the resilience dim dimensions that are particular to St. Kitts and Nevis as we seek to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, at the special request of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I am going to try to say something about the blue economy, um, which is indeed an important topic. Um, and I will end by just making a couple of comments on foreign policy and diplomacy as supporting pillars for implementing the SDGs and for reinforcing our resilience. Now, development paradigms have shifted considerably during the last, during the last 50 years. They have been, now, and, and as we struggle to understand and cope with the environmental, socio-political, economic, and, and economic turbulence, I, excuse me, of the late 20th, 20th and early 21st centuries, um, we will notice that development has been more and more focused on sustainable human development. That is balancing economic growth with human welfare and with the protection of the ecosphere, which is essential for the survival of all living things. Now, this framework, which was championed by the United Nations since the 19, late 1980s, has influenced the development thinking of individual states and societies. I just want to mention on this screen the commitments relating to small island developing states. The Barbados Program of Action in, back in 1994, the Mauritius Strategy of Implementation in 2005, and the Samoa Pathway, which was um, adopted in 2014, and which focuses on building resilient societies and economies in small island developing states. Now, the Pathway document was the SIDS contribution to the consultations leading up to the post-MDG development framework. And the Samoa pathway focuses not only on building resilient economies and societies, but on the indispensable role of the international community in supporting the local and national efforts with development cooperation programs. So the efforts 
of the Caribbean and other small island states fall within this broader paradigm of human development. And I'm going to just, again, refresh your memory um, with, first of all, the development agenda that we had from 2000 to 2015. I don't think I need to spell out the Millennium Development Goals. So let us focus on the successor framework which we have adopted post-2015. The um, sorry, I, the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda. Now, just quickly, because I'm sure you cannot read what is written under those um, graphics, the Sustainable Development Goals are 17, and they encompass eradicating poverty, eradicating hunger, good health, um, attaining good health and well-being, that's number three. Number four, quality education. Number five, gender equity. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Number seven, affordable clean energy. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Number nine, industry and innovation and infrastructure. Number 10, reducing inequality. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And number 12, responsible consum consumption. Numbers 13 and 14, we'll say a little bit about tonight. Climate action and life below water. Um, number 15, life on land. Number 16, peace and justice and strong institutions. And number 17, partnerships to achieve these goals. Now this is a very challenging agenda that the global community has set itself. But it is one which emphasizes the integrated and overlapping and intersectoral dimensions of development and one which allows societies to emphasize the SDGs that are most relevant for their own advancement while simultaneously advancing the others. And embedded in the SDG agenda is the notion of resilience building across a, a range of, cat, of sectors. Now I want to spend a few minutes on the concept of resilience. What does it mean and what does it imply for our development policies? Now, resilience is inextricably linked to notions of vulnerability and risk. And without going into details, I want us to remember that the Caribbean countries were central diplomatic actors and players in the initiation and the championing of the vulnerability and resilience discourse from the Grenada crisis in 1983 for the next 20 years until the concept of vulnerability became fully accepted in terms of global development planning. Now, let's just speak a little bit about um, what these mean. Vulnerability means, of course, susceptible, it's susceptibility to risks and threats to economic, environmental, social and political security and stability. And all states are vulnerable to varying degrees. Um, resilience, on the other hand, means the extent to which a country can withstand or recover from external shocks, largely through good policies, strong institutions, and forward planning. Now a country's level of risk is calculated by juxtaposing the vulnerability score and the resilience score. And in studies that have been done by Lino Brigulio and other people, um, they came to the conclusion that size 
has an impact on the extent of vul overall vulnerability of countries, but that countries which had high vulnerability and high resilience scores were often small states with good governance, good governance indicators, and countries that had high vulnerability scores and high resilient, low resilience scores were mostly small states with weak economic governance. Now, these studies indicated that vulnerability indices can and should be used to support policy making in small states because they can often suggest priority areas for resilience building. They demonstrate re the relevance of strong economic, political, social and environmental management, especially for small territories. Resilience measures can be incorporated into development plans and strategies. And we saw a good example this morning when Ambassador Grandison of the, Com of the CARICOM Secretariat referred to the 2015 to 2019 strategic plan, which focuses on techno building technological, social, environmental, and economic resilience not only within the Secretariat, but also um, supporting member countries in pursuing this path. And he underlined the point that the regional coordination of foreign and external affairs is viewed as an enabling instrument for resilience building in these areas. Now, strong resilience indicators may attract more foreign direct investment and vulnerability indices are, and probably should be even more, considered by the international community in determining policy towards small middle income developing states, with the focus being on building with more resilience. Environmental management is a key aspect of resilience building, especially for small island developing states. And Vulnerability, the fact that vulnerability exists, dictates permanent, proactive, the need for permanent, proactive approaches to minimize the impact of external shocks, which can and will happen at some point. Now, there are critiques of this paradigm, but nonetheless, it has influenced policy formulation to a great extent, both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific and other small state jurisdictions since the early 1990s. Now, I want to go from this to look at, um, to look at recent development um, updates in the Caribbean. And because since we are working according to the SDGs, we've um, tried our best with the MDGs, and we do have, fortunately, periodic develop, human development reports. We had one in 2012, we had another in 2016. So how are we doing? And the Caribbean Human Development Report of um, issued by the, prepared by UNDP and a number of actors across the Caribbean. This was an invitation to rethink the building of human resilience in this region and to go below the state level, to focus on communities and households and individuals as the essential building blocks in our resilience paradigm. And of course, it invokes our bugbears, our structural challenges of high debt and disaster susceptibility. It pointed overall to the very heavy impact of the global recession and the fact that most of our countries had slipped in terms of human development indicators since um, 2011. And it highlighted something that is not peculiar to the Caribbean, in fact, it's um, associated with Latin America as a whole, that people in this part of the world 
do not manage to rise out of poverty and stay um, beyond the clutches of poverty for a very long time. The same people who succeed in climbing out of the poverty trap are quite likely to fall back down again due to shocks from the labor market and the economy, health challenges, and environmental disasters. This was also pointed out this morning by Ambassador Schillingford when she was speaking about the impact of 2017 on places like Dominica and many other um, Caribbean countries. Now, this report also identifies vulnerable groups in the Caribbean, or most vulnerable groups, as being women, the elderly, youth, especially young males, and low-income youth, people with disabilities, and indigenous and maroon communities across the region. And it points to the fact that regionally, Caribbean as a whole, our expenditure on social protection and on health systems is low. It's lower than the Latin American average, and it is much lower than the average of developed countries. There is high youth unemployment and underemployment across the Caribbean. There is variable progress on health. Some cases, um, good progress. St. Kitts and Nevis and Antigua made outstanding progress in reducing child mortality, um, for example. But all of us have done very badly with non-communicable diseases and a few communicable ones. We're not that healthy on either. And there are noticeable gaps in delivering quality education. And that report of 2016 recommends, first of all, that we renew our focus on social protection that will target the most vulnerable groups in our societies, and that we deepen overall our human and social development initiatives, that we focus on inclusive growth, growth that adopts the whole society, doesn't marginalize people, and that we make a major push on efforts towards environmental sustainability and resilience building in light of natural disasters and climate change. Now there are two, others, two other important reports I just want to refer to because I think they have some significance for us when we're speaking of resilience building. How are we doing in the area of crime and violence? <clears throat> there was a report by the Inter-American Development Bank in 2017 now, everybody here should be aware that Latin America and the Caribbean rank pretty high in terms of homicides and violence, and Central America and the Caribbean are the two most violent subregions in the Americas. Now, what is important is that the governmental costs of crime in the Caribbean amount to 2% of our annual GDP and our overall crime-related costs in 2014 equaled almost 4% of GDP. Now that's a, that's a high figure, but what is important to note if we're focusing on resilience building is that most of the public crime-fighting budget goes to the security forces and a fraction, 2%, is spent on improving our judicial systems, improving the prison systems in most of our countries, and on social programs for violence prevention and reduction. Something we need to bear in mind as we seek to continue advancing towards resilient societies. And finally, climate change and natural disasters. In 2016 and 2017, almost 4,000 deaths in the Caribbean were related to hurricanes. And there were huge economic losses for Caribbean states and territories alike. In 2017 to 2019, there has been increased seismic activity recorded across the Caribbean basin. And there's an increased related risk of tsunamis. 
So therefore, it is logical for resilience building against climate change and against natural disaster to be an ongoing feature of Caribbean regional and global cooperation agenda. In this, it's important to recognize the crucial role of regional cooperation and regional agencies. And it's important also to recognize that we can't build resilience against natural disasters without building our local democracy networks, having large-scale community participation in agenda setting, in budgetary decision making, in agreeing to evacuation procedures, and we need to continue public education on things like building codes and things like not building too close to the coast or cutting down the forest so we get landslides and the houses tumble down off the mountains. And other public ed education that will strengthen resilience and good disaster management. Now, resilience building and St. Kitts and Nevis. I think that much of our resilience related policies and the diplomatic focus of the past decade have focused on the search to regain macroeconomic stability. And our diplomacy has been extremely energetic in terms of negotiating um, economic and financial resilience building in the transition away from sugar production. But there may be the need still to critically examine the long-term sustainability of our economic programs. There is certainly always the need to continue diversifying economic activity and growth patterns, placing the emphasis on sustainability and resilience building against the many risks that we face. We are extremely small. We have a fairly narrow economic base. And this means fairly narrow economic base. We have very large proportions of the, of the labor force um, dependent on tourism. We have 30% or more of our budget coming from one or two sources of income. This means that these are potential risk factors. And so, diversification, prudent fiscal management, strong governance of the country's economic assets, and a focus on transparency and accountability to the population as a whole are crucial for, con for economic resilience building. Now, also, resilience building has both internal and external dimensions. I know that we are thinking primarily in terms of the diplomatic thrust this week, but resilience building starts within a society, and the drivers of the process are undoubtedly the strength of its institutions and our governance processes. So, social stability and cohesion are an essential ingredient of resilience and our institutional strength, our national institutional strength and our social strength must be the starting points of our quest to have a truly resilient country. Now, as far as social resilience goes, some pointers Some pointers for resilience building in St. Kitts and Nevis would be, of course, um, some pointers for institutional deepening and governance. First of all, making our consultations on development directions as broad-based as possible. 
encouraging inclusive decision making based on the participation of non-governmental actors, including the private sector, community organizations, youth, civil society groups of all kinds, and the diasporic community who contribute significantly to household welfare in our society. Small societies need to harness the benefits of all available in expertise and insights. This can only be done through inclusive approaches to governance and through formalizing those dialogue channels for participation and for reporting and encouraging greater national ownership, particularly if we are attempting new sustainable development initiatives. Another um, direction that can be useful is to explore international best practice, including from other small states, in terms of governance frameworks for sustainable management of development programs and for precious economic and environmental assets. Strong legislative frameworks and accompanying regulatory guidelines and agencies are essential. Now this is emphasized in all of the recent environmental reports for St. Kitts and Nevis that I have been able to access, um, which spoke of the need to update many, much of our uh, environmental protection framework and the need to underpin legislation with regulations and guidelines and the need also to strengthen our enforcement in, in several areas and the need to increase public education. Now, as far as social resilience building goes, there were crucial pointers in the Caribbean Human Development Reports that I mentioned. And all of them, they need to be, this needs to be addressed at the sub-national, the national and the regional levels, as is currently the case. Now, St. Kitts Nevis has a relatively good record in social protection programs on which we can build and expand the opportunities for most vulnerable groups. It is imperative, if we're thinking about resilience, if we're thinking about sustainable development, to focus on expanding possibilities for all of our youth, leaving no one behind. It is imperative to focus on quality education for a rapidly changing world in which none of the jobs that people have been accustomed to doing might be there for much longer. It's important to focus on science education to give them the chance to develop new skills and to develop new economic sectors. It is also very important in, our, in order to build social cohesion to have parenting education and parenting support programs and community and NGO partnerships to support those. Now we are, even though we are extremely small, we are a very diverse society. And I think we really need to put even greater emphasis on developing public education programs on diversity and tolerance and cultural openness in our tourism dependent society and a society that has very high migrant inflows and outflows. Likewise, there's a crucial need to continue strengthening our environmental and climate change public education programs for all sectors of our society. I think you would all agree that crime prevention and rehabilitation programs are essential elements in our social resilience building. And now, well, I wanted to say something about the blue economy relevance for St. Kitts and Nevis for two reasons. One, it's a, it is a crucial aspect of environmental resilience building and it may also possibly offer new sources of economic diversification. Now, since 2012,
this idea of the blue economy, that is an economy based on the oceans, is, has been seen as a new avenue for economic diversification and for sustainable growth, especially for small island developing states. The, U, the UNDP speaks of it as the next step in sustainable human development. Basically, it aims at getting countries to exercise better stewardship of our marine resources, of our oceans, to mitigate the impact of ocean-based economic activity, which is fairly intense, and which is leaving um, very detrimental repercussions on most of our oceans. It's meant to foster ocean-based businesses and jobs. The oceans and seas of the world are not only a renewable energy source, potential renewable energy source, they are carbon sinks. They help to absorb some of global warming. Ocean and coastal preservation builds resilience to climate change, SDG 13, through sustainably managing the ocean ecosystem and resources which are finite. They're not gonna last forever if we don't take care of them. And many, um, how did I get there? Yeah. Well, there are many sources which tell us that um, overall the ocean economy contributes about 3% of GDP, but for some small island developing states, for instance, those in the Indian Ocean, um, their ocean sectors a couple of years back in 2013 generated over 1 billion US dollars in revenue. Now, this has great relevance for the Caribbean. The Caribbean is very, even now, we have, a, we, have a, we have an ocean economy, it might not be blue. We account for 60% of global cruise tourism. Our fishing sector is underdeveloped. It could earn much more. But the legal export earnings by Caribbean countries um, in 2012 generated about a quarter million, 250 million US dollars. Aquaculture is still small, but it's potentially va valuable for our food security. We have 10% of the global stock of coral reefs. We're destroying them, quite a lot have been destroyed, but we still have 10%. We have between 25 and 50% of the global stocks of seagrass which act as carbon sinks. And we have extensive offshore um, mineral extraction activity in Trinidad, Suriname, and Guyana. Those account for large percentages of their GDP. Sea transport is important in the Caribbean, right here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, our local ferries, we've had a very successful experience of ferry privatization and the state regulating the safety standards of our ferries. And this has generated another entrepreneurial opportunity and employment growth in the ferry sector. We could probably expand beyond our inter-island ferries between St. Kitts and Nevis. In fact, we do. Our ferries go to St. Martin all the time, to Stacia, to Antigua we might be able to do a bit more. Um, some countries in the Caribbean depend on desalinated water for part of their drinking water. So as you can see, we have an ocean economy. It might not be as blue as we would like it to be, but it exists. Now, the UNDP divides the blue economy into two parts. Um, one is the protection and restoration of ocean resources from intensified, um, their intensified present economic activity and climatic changes. And 
deriving greater returns from the current economic activity on our coasts and in our seas and doing it in a sustainable way. And then the second part of the ocean economy is what you, the potential to develop future activities. Um, that requires much more scientific know-how and investment. Um, the potential for renewable energy, um, the planting of mangroves to act as coastal defenses and carbon sinks. That is something we really need to do in St. Kitts and Nevis. We have lost most of our mangrove forests, largely due to coastal economic development. Marine aquaculture, marine biotechnology. I read not too long ago that two very important um, pharmaceuticals were developed from sponges in the Caribbean. We didn't develop them or benefit from the revenues. One was a, a leukemia um, drug in the 1960s, and the second is a po very popular HIV ARV medication. Those were derived from sea creatures in the Caribbean. Um, we can do a lot with the seaweed that we complain about. Some people are trying to do things with it, um, whether it is as fertilizer or as potential cosmetics, base for cosmetics and so on. There's a lot that can be done if you have the scientific expertise. And of course, there are ocean-related tourism acti activities, ocean-based. For example, dive tourism already exists and can become much bigger. Now both, many of the international agencies stress that each country has to develop its own vision of its blue economy options and then build its policies and programs around that, those visions. Now we also have a lot of challenges if we are going in that direction, which have to be recognized, have to be acknowledged. Um, the extensive marine habitat degradation that exists and the pollution from our present economic activities both on sea and on land, including cruise tourism. We have lost at least a quarter of our mangrove forests in the last few years in the Caribbean. And equally important, importantly, a switch to a blue economy economy approach requires major changes in our economic valuation and our accounting, in human resource development programs and education curricula. I'm pretty sure that here we don't have teaching swimming as part of the school sports programs. Right. Didn't have it when I was a child, we still don't have it. And it would be easy to develop if we shifted resources a little bit. Training priorities, investment in new technologies, and the recruitment of new skills into the labor market, and massive public education programs. Now, all of this is a long-term path, and probably an expensive path, which means shifting resources from some other activities. But ultimately, the returns could be of inestimable value. Now, strategic diplomacy. Just a few pointers. I'm about to finish. I'll put you out of your agony shortly. <laughs> now, in the past, various small island developing states have shown intellectual leadership in the international community. When you're small, very small, you have to be agile, you have to be creative, you have to come up periodically with really good ideas that other people buy into. Malta is a good example. Malta championed the negotiation and adoption of the Law of the Sea Convention. Malta was again um, very proactive, to, and later on other um, small island states, in pushing for the United Nations framework, um, framework for climate change, framework convention for climate change. Um, and beyond that, the Caribbean with the vulnerability and resilience discourse. Yet, well, it's my opinion, um, some might disagree, 
I don't think the Caribbean has fully consolidated a new vision around which to organize our foreign policy. Now there is one interesting example that I thought I would mention, which is the Pacific Islands' current attempt to reinvent themselves from being merely small island states to being large ocean states. This is the this is their ide regional identity that they are now promoting, and this informs their current and probably will inform their future foreign policy. It will be a challenging concept to carry forward, but it is also a very interesting one, and it demonstrates intellectual leadership for very small countries. The Caribbean has not yet fully embraced the blue economy possibilities. One example of that is the fact that the Commonwealth has nine action groups on the blue economy. And you have leader states in these groups. There is only one Caribbean country that has opted to be a leader in any of these groups. And that is Belize, which is a champion state in the area of coral reef conservation. Compared to that, two Pacific states are leaders, two Indian Ocean states are leaders, and one Mediterranean. These are small island developing states I'm talking about. And there is a Mediterranean one which is not developing but is a small island state. Um, the Caribbean hasn't fully come on board with this initiative yet. Um, now, Strategic diplomacy and effective dialogue. A lot was said this morning. I think the, the panel from the region, our regional organizations was extremely useful in highlighting effective dialogue, um, successes, and strategic diplomacy. But I just wanted to re reiterate that we need to fully utilize our regional groupings and agencies and the opportunities that they provide for coordinated approaches. Senkits and Nevis does this, and Senkits and Nevis has clearly been taking a very active role in regional diplomacy now and has done in the past. Now, region, our regional platform possibilities extend beyond the historical and traditional groupings, and we have also been seeing that in the last few years in the Caribbean. Also, strategic diplomacy means utilizing to the full the multilateral forum and identifying which forum presents the best possibilities for enhancing sustainable development and resilience in a particular area. There's a Commonwealth, there's ECLAC, there's UNDP, et cetera, et cetera and in which one or with, with which organization can we develop and pursue um, particular themes. We will of course, we need of course to continue the cooperation with traditional partners and adapt the dialogue to new realities and conditions. A lot of that is happening with the European Union at the present time, both as part of the post-Cotonou um, negotiations and also, as came up this morning, um, the very robust diplomatic exchanges on um, the EU's blacklisting policies and the impact that it has had on several states in the Caribbean. We Strategic diplomacy means also a continuing to explore South-South cooperation which is increasingly important for all of us in the Caribbean. And exploring new alliances and relationships in a rapidly changing global landscape. The world looks very different from what it looked like at the beginning of the 1990s. And we have to recognize that and reconfigure our strategic diplomacy. Now, there are many types of diplomatic and dialogue partnerships, not all with states and not all with international organizations. 
There are many development partners. There are non-independent territories in our region and elsewhere. There are civil society organizations, businesses, philanthropic or faith-based communities, diasporic organizations, professional networks, and the list goes on. All of these have to be incorporated into our dialogue networks. Um, particularly for sustainable human development and for resilience building, a diverse mix of partnerships may prove to be very re rewarding. And that concludes my remarks tonight. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>